why study Japanese? Isn't studying Aikido already hard enough? But uh, I, I think that there are two answers to it. One is um, to communicate, to all be able to speak the same language, and, and then to uh, deepen and enrich your understanding of, of Aikido. Aikido is a Japanese art. And like any art or science, it has its own lexicon. And I mean, you wouldn't, uh, you know, you wouldn't go to engineering school and, and assume that you're not going to have to speak engineering lingo. Um, it's just critical to that study, to that science, that art. But it's more than that, really. Um, you know, and this goes back to the old saying that uh, when you meet somebody and you give them your name and they don't say anything, what do you say? Idiomatically, you say, you have me at a disadvantage. And you do. If you do not speak Japanese in this Japanese art, I think you are at a distinct disadvantage. So it, it behooves you to, to start working. These, these are grouped into three sections. Um, and the first one, when in Japan, just like when in Rome. You've got, to, you've got to adapt a little bit. And the first grouping, bonsai and banzai, um, I picked this because uh, it's to illustrate a point, pronunciation matters. It's funny how often people mispronounce these terms. Uh, you always hear people say, oh, you know, I have a little bonsai tree. Okay? No, it's bonsai. And you need to work on that. Because there is a difference. I mean, bonsai is a tray planting. It's you know a miniature tree or bush or whatever. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, obviously, a, a more aesthetic emphasis to it. Bonsai means literally ten thousand years, and that's more of a a cheer, uh, a blessing. Um, for example, uh, um, the Japanese uh, samurai or military would say ten no heka banzai um, it means may the emperor live 10,000 years but it's kind of you know it's Mr. Spock it's live long and prosper um, <laughs> uh, the uh, the next grouping respect and disrespect um, this really has to do with attitude and manners um, <clears throat> there's a um, <clears throat> you know there's always an acceptable etiquette in any social circle. And um, we also say training begins and ends with etiquette. They, uh, I, I, that's sort of translated as respect, um, but you would also say etiquette, attitude, manners, good or bad. Um, and it also refers specifically to the act of bowing. I think that this is one of the single most important things. Um, you know, uh, every martial art has its courtesies. You bow when you enter the dojo, karate, people might say, Os, um, uh, but it's really important in Aikido. And um, I, I see people, and I'm watching all the time. I'm watching my students, I'm watching other people's students. I see people get come in and go out without bowing to the tokonoma. And frankly, you know, if you want to be truly correct and truly formal, you should get down in Seiza and bow to the Tokonoma, bow to a sensei. Not, you know, because it's some kind of religious thing, but it is a sign of respect. It's, it's an appreciation, it's a gratitude for being able to practice this art, thanks to all of us and thanks to O Sensei. And, and so these are, these are things not to be missed because without it, you don't really have a deeper understanding art that we are doing. You should not sit to your sit with your back directly to O Sensei, even when you're in the midst of practice and, and you're working perhaps with a group of three people and you sit down, you should try to orient yourself. The instructor's teaching and you sit down to listen, you should orient yourself so you're not sitting with your back directly to O Sensei. It's just rude. And that brings us to Shitsure. Shitsure is is rude, rudeness. Um, Disrespect, shitsu, uh, means it's it's the prefix dis, or literally a loss of something, a loss of respect. Um, uh, 
and you would, for example, use this in the context of you say just like you say arigato gozaimasu. might mean I'm being rude in the sense that I'm leaving before the rest of you. I've got to leave. You all are continuing to train. I'm leaving. Okay. Um, would be if you are excusing yourself in the sense that you, like, for example, bump somebody. You bump into them and you say, uh, I, I did something rude. This, too, you know, doesn't get disseminated much um, and should, I think. There should be a, a separate class for it, really. Um, but, uh, you know, bowing is, is not done with your head or your, uh, your mid-back. It's done from your hips, right? If you're standing and you bow, you don't really do this. You should be bowing from your hips. You keep the line of your head, neck, and, and torso straight, and you bow from your hips. The lower you go, the more respect you're showing. It's especially true when you're down in Cezanne and you go to bow. You know, sometimes you see people stick their hands out like this. It's, you, you basically bring your hands to a, a triangle in front of you, and, and when you bow, you really stop when your elbows touch the mat. And you don't drop your head because this exposes the neck. And this was considered to be rude. Um, you might say waki. Waki can also be translated as armpit. But it just means showing something uh, that you know, is, is somewhat disrespectful. You know, A few hundred years ago, you show your neck like that, you might lose your head. So <laughs> you want to think about keeping your, your posture straight when you bow. It's, that, too, is a part of the sign of respect. The next grouping, junior, senior, teacher, and knight. Um, this grouping is uh, sort of meant to convey rank, uh, duty, honor. Um, <clears throat> kohai, junior, that's anyone who's junior to you. Um, it actually translates literally as behind companion. And senior, uh, or senpai, uh, also translates literally as a head companion, somebody who's ahead of you in, in rank, in wisdom, somebody who's behind you in, in experience. The kohai senpai thing is just not sort of like, you know, I'm better than you, you're lesser than me. It conveys a sense of duty and responsibility. Kohai, in the sense of loyalty to their senpai and, and uh, a, a sense of respect, and I'm following behind you. And for senpai, too, um, a responsibility to your kohai to bring them along, teach them properly, uh, not in the sense of sensei, but rather in the sense of being a good role model. Don't just sort of, you know, do whatever. Um, somebody's coming behind, and they're depending on you to show them the way. Uh, that brings us to sensei. Um, uh, we say teacher, oh sensei, great teacher. Um, actually, literally, it translates as um, coming before, as in you, you're born before somebody. So <laughs> it's not just a teacher. The assumption, though, is that somebody who is born ahead of you uh, is wiser than you, not always, but <laughs> You know, they should be able to impart some wisdom, and so you think of them as sensei, somebody who's ahead of you. Samurai, I prefer to translate this as knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, uh, because of the, um, because of the uh, connotation of uh, feudal society, chivalry, honor, courage, fealty, sworn loyalty to a lord, for example. Um, People often think, oh, samurai, that's a Japanese warrior. Um, that's not accurate. Uh, bushi, uh, the character for bushi, or, or also um, pronounced take, like uh, in takemusu, takemusu aiki, um, that's warrior. Samurai is different. Samurai literally is, and some of you have probably heard of it before, samurai is literally one who serves. So it's like not some, you know, big guy who's going to be able to, you know, beat you up and, and do this and do that. It's not, it, it's not martial in that sense. It's martial in the sense of sworn loyalty, fealty, um, <clears throat> virtues of chivalry and honor. So I think it's best to think of it in those terms. Next grouping, please and thank you. 
these are obvious courtesies that everybody should know when starting uh, Aikido. Um, onegai shimasu, uh, literally, you could translate it as I make a wish of you or, uh, or I ask a favor of you. Um, onegai is a, a favor or a wish. Um, and um, <clears throat> this, you know, this too, you would say onegai shimasu. I, I make a wish, I ask a favor of you, please take care of me. And we all know you say this when you begin to practice with people. We don't often say onegai shimashita. Um, that implies that you're maybe recounting a story to somebody, like um, karega onegai shimashita, he asked a favor of me. Uh, so you don't really say that in the context of bowing to somebody, even though we know when you are, uh, when you are thanking someone, you would say arigato gozaimasu, I'm thanking you in the here and now, or arigato gozaimashita, I'm thanking you for what you just did. <clears throat> okay, next section, blending and, and footwork. Um, well, these I consider to be the building blocks of Aikido, uh, Aikido DNA, if you will. You know, we use these to build organisms technical organisms that we use in our art. Ukemi, um, you know, I translated that as blending. I mean, it actually literally translates as receive body or receiving body. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this means receiving, the body is receiving whatever, uh, whether it's the mat or your partner. Um, so, it often gets translated loosely as falling, but it has a lot more, a lot deeper sense than that. It, uh, it's reflexive and protective. It suggests that you are doing something that is responsive to a force that your body has encountered. Um, it's, uh, um, well, let's keep, you know, I mean, one example would be I feel that I feel this this push through me, right? And you know, rather than you know, rather than trying to resist it, ukedu to receive, and then I just move with it, right? So it implies that there's some force that causes your body to 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 be reflexive and to protect itself. Um, Tai sabaki. Tai sabaki is, uh, I like to translate this as footwork. It really translates literally as body movement, um, especially in the sense of efficiency. Well, you know, uh, I mean, there are really only three and a half types of, of movements for, for our purposes, right? Um, but Tai sabaki sort of comprises all of them. Iri me, like a slide or a step. Tenkan, like a turning step back, or step tenkan, tension, stepping back or shifting back, and then a half movement, tenkai, right? All three and a half of those movements, and whether you slide or step, it turns it into six and a half movements. All of those make up Tai Saba. Okay, we're on to technically speaking. Um, so this, uh, um, <clears throat> the first grouping, breath and technique, um, I, this to me uh, sort of encapsulates why you need to know more Japanese. And the more Japanese that you know, at least you know, from, a, from a lexicon perspective, the richer, deeper understanding of Aikido you're going to have. Um, everybody's aware of some of the meaning of kokyu. I mean, it's literally breath or breathing uh, in the sense of respiration. Um, but uh, <clears throat> more, you know, more accurately, I think, it, 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 it means to convey a sense of timing and positioning, especially when executing techniques. And so in that sense, breath and technique, I really think of them as two different things. Um, 
technique, coqu can be technique. Technique is not necessarily coq. You can, uh, you can execute a technique without thinking enough about coq, the timing and positioning that you need in order to blend with an attack. Um, in that sense, it's really just technical. It's just jutsu. Um, coq implies that uh, you're, you're using the technique in a certain way. But it's, I think, a mistake to just sort of use that as some kind of blanket reference to this or that technique. So in other words, coq is really general, and waza is specific. So um, you, you know, <laughs> I mean, people say, oh, let's do that kokunage. What kokunage? I mean, there are a bunch of them. You know, it's, it, you're really referring to doing a throw with proper respiration, with proper timing and position. So, you know, it's kind of like say, oh, do that thing where you, you, you know, you turn around and step back and then you go under their arm and then you cut down and, you know, huh, what, you know? In that case, you really do need to, um, to differentiate. So, um, you know, uh, everybody knows moro te tori ho, right? Um, ho in this case means direction. Um, and in this sense, this technique is called that because the idea is that I'm using timing and positioning to redirect his attack, right? Um, but, you know, and I should say, you know, would have referred specifically to this technique as hitoe iminagi, a layered iriminagi. Hitoe means layer. Um, some people call this sokumen iriminagi. Um, but that's, that's much more specific. That's much more specific than just saying kokyu ho, which implies doing that technique with proper respiration, a sense, a real sense of timing and position. Or waza, okay? This is translated as, as technique. You could also translate it as method, a method of doing something. Um, and, uh, you know, this one, you, know, you can get really, really technical. Um, sensei. You know, one, one technique that Kanai Sensei liked a lot, right, is Yohiza Tate Tayo Toshi, okay? Um, you know, if you know what that means, it helps a lot with your understanding of the technique. So, Yohiza means both knees. Tate means kneel. Tai Otoshi means a body drop. So once you know what that means, and once you remember how to say it, you know, <laughs> then you know, you've got a better sense of why it's that, and also how to tell somebody else to do it. Instead of just saying, oh, you know, you grab me, you grab my wrist, and then I strike you, and then I turn around, and then I go down to my knees and throw you, why not just say, Dio, he's a tete toshi. <laughs> um, so, uh, stance and distance and unbalance, um, these refer to posture, good or bad. Um, so, uh, kamai, kamai means uh, stance, um, but it also means posture, especially in relation to something or someone else. Um, so, uh, you, you know, hami, for example you're offering half of a target. That is a, that is a half stance, that's a half kamai offered to your opponent so that you're not giving them a full target to attack. Um, ken no kamai is the stance that you would take if you were holding a sword. So right foot forward, right hand forward, this is ken no kamai. Jo no kamai, you, you would start I mean, it's, am, it's an ambidextrous uh, weapon, but it's typically you start with your left leg far. So it's just uh, a reference to stance and how to stand and how to position and posture so, yourself vis-a-vis -vis someone else or something else. Um, Ma'ai, uh, distance, especially the distance between you and something or someone else, um, 
and it actually literally means the space to meet. So it's, it's the distance, the space required to, to actually meet up with something or someone else. Um, and so, you know, we certainly think of this in martial terms, like uh, the ma'ai for katate tori is different from the ma'ai when you start to add weapons, right? So um, you're not going to be quite as close to, you're not going to want to stand quite as close to somebody who's holding a knife. You'll be a little bit further away for somebody who's holding a sword. You'll be even further away for somebody who's holding a jaw. So, you know, that ma'ai changes in a martial sense. Um, but this is a, um, now we're really getting into a deeper understanding of Japanese culture. Ma'ai is a big deal uh, for the Japanese day to day and, you know, not in a martial sense. Um, it is, uh, you know, it is, it is how you carry and conduct yourself rel relative to the space around you and other people around you. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, and they are hyper-conscious of it um, through, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years of, of cultural development in a country that has, you know, basically uh, two-thirds of the population of the United States in a, in a country that's one-eighth as big as the United States. And that's if you include all of the arable land. Um, so, you know, they really do, uh, they're, they're conscious. And, you know, I mean, sometimes it can't be helped. You're being packed onto a, a train in Tokyo Station. You know, you can't help that. But, but the Japanese would, I think, be very conscious of how they sit next to people um, you know, uh, one example that probably people don't even think about is, um, I think most, I think this is true of most Japanese inside and outside of Japan who do Aikido, uh, they would likely, when folding their hakama, do it completely different from how we do. And I'm not talking about tying the strands. Um, I'm talking about just how much space they use to do something, right? So we typically would, you know, pull the, the, the straps of our hakama way out, you know, and then do them up like this. And, you know, they will actually pull them in. They gather them in slowly and take as little space as possible. You know, I'm always telling the kids in the kids program, they all bunch together like peas in a pod. You know, they're all jostling against each other. There should be a little bit of elbow you know, that is ma'ai also, okay? But then ma'ai also conveys a sense of um, balance, you know, or, or lack of balance. So um, another funny situation that often occurs, even in my own dojo, every day, practically, um, the instructor will sit right in front of the tokonoma, and the students will line up, and, you know, if I'm teaching that day, I turn around and the students are lined up like this, you know, I mean, generally by rank, you know, but, but it'll be kind of lopsided. And I turn around and I feel like I'm going to fall over, you know. Um, there's no sense of, of symmetry. There's no sense of balance when they line up. Um, or, for example, you know, if, if it were just me teaching a couple of students, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to turn around and see that they are sitting like right next to each other, like Kevin and Tom, um, you know, instead of somehow having a little bit of balance, almost like, like an equilateral triangle. That, you know, to me is also a sense of ma, uh, a sense of balance, a sense of proper distance, and it's respectful too. Uh, boy, we spend a lot of time on that. Okay. Um, <laughs> kuzushi. Kuzushi is, um, it's, it's unbalancing. Um, it literally is translated as broken posture. So, you know, you take it from there. Kuzushi is what we always try to achieve when we're executing an open, right? It doesn't matter what the open is, you know. Um, you know, if I, if I simply do this and this, and Keith is still standing straight, you know, like he's got this iron rod through his body, I have not achieved Kuzushi, okay? I need to move in a way that begins to unbalance. 
right? That's the objective of openness, to break their bounds. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, entering and turning and shifting and pivoting, we've already talked about this earlier. Um, this is tight. All of these collectively are Thai Sabaki. Um, <clears throat> and Thai Sabaki is footwork, uh, more literally translated as efficient body movement. And these are the components that make up um, any any of the techniques, you know. So, for example, you know, uh, idimi sabaki, um, in, an entering idimi means entering body, right? And sabaki just means movement. So, if Keith does yoko menuchi, right, and I move in, right, I'm trying to achieve kizushi by doing idimi sabaki, right? Um, for for ten kan, well, we, we're all very familiar with this, right? Ten kan is a, a turning and step back, right? But um, this, the Tenkan means more than just the turning. Tenkan actually implies that there is a force around which you must turn, right? So that, that really elicits the, the Tai no Henko, is, is that sense of turning around something that would otherwise block you or, or force you to go in a different direction. But um, it's, not just a, it's not just a change of direction. You can also use tenkan to refer to a change of attitude. For example, kibun tenkan means a change in your mood, better or worse. Um, tenshen, tenshen is um, shifting body. Um, and you know we've already seen this, right? Tenshen sabaki, for example, would be to step back. No matter what you're doing, right, you shift back, right? That's that's tension sabaki, right? And then ten tai, that last half movement, the ten tai means to pivot, pivoting body, and so the idea is you're doing a 180 degree hip turn. Um, let's see, front and back and outside and inside and through directions. Without them, you're lost. So, you know, everybody learns um, omote ikkyo and ura ikkyo from a very early stage in your career. Everybody understands that omote, right? Omote is moving across his front, right? Ura is moving around his back, right? Um, but then uh, they often get mixed up, you know. You might think, for example, that because I'm moving back here, this must be ura, and it is, right? But more appropriately, we might refer to this if we were doing soto kaiten naye as outside. Soto means outside. Uchi kaiten naye, right? inside. I'm going inside of him, right? And then surinuke, this is also surinuke, slipping through. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside. If he comes Yoko Manucci, this too is Sudinuke, right? Slipping past or sliding past. Um, <clears throat> okay, pin and throw and drop and hit. These are all classifications of, and very Aikido classifications of, um, uh, of <clears throat> uh, Waza. Um, whether you're talking about um, katame waza, which is grappling, right? And we don't do a lot of grappling in Aikido, but um, osai is a pin, uh, and that osai is a osai waza is a part of katame waza. Um, and then nage waza is obviously throwing techniques, and uh, nage waza is traditionally composed of either tachi waza, standing techniques or sutemi waza, where you're actually sacrificing yourself to throw. Um, <clears throat> so osai, um, the pin, you know, this is one of, uh, one of three types of katame waza. Um, there's osai, which is a pin like ikkyo nikkyo. There is um, uh, kansetsu waza, like, uh, you know, when you attack the joint. Um, and, uh, and then there's also shime waza, where you're, where you're choking somebody. Um, nage waza, it, you know, nage we also know is 
the person who throws. So nage means to throw. Um, <clears throat> but nage waza is, is a larger classification of kinds of throws. And um, we're, we're dialing into more detail than we have time to discuss here, but on to otoshi. Otoshi is a kind of nage waza. Um, it's, it, otoshi is actually a kind of te waza, which is a kind of tachi waza, which is a kind of nage waza. Okay? Keep that in mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, irimi nage, I think we all understand that. That's an entering throw. Um, when, you, when you start to get into otoshis and koshis, you know, some of it begins to overlap a little bit with judo. But, you know, um, I mean, for example, you know, you might think seoi otoshi. Otoshi means to drop. Seoi is over your back, right? So, you know, it helps, again, when you understand what the words are and, um, when you reference these things. Koshi, right? Koshi just means hip, and that's any throw that occurs on the hip, right? So, tsurube goshi, for example. Um, that's winding them up. On to infinity and beyond. Um, and these concepts I grouped them together because they represent the, the philosophical perspective of Aikido, um, particularly in O Sensei's later years, um, but also larger martial concepts that, um, that had developed long before the sensei came along too, um, states of mind. And so the first grouping is in fact states of mind, um, beginner mind, centered mind, <coughs> uh, no mind, remaining mind. Um, these are all very martial concepts. Um, but mind means more than just thought. Mind really in this case means also heart and soul. Um, so shoshin, literally means, it's literally translated as first heart. Um, but we often hear beginner's mind, and the premise there is that you should never lose that fresh perspective that you have, and, and additionally the sense of humility that comes with a beginner's mind. I mean, you don't know really what you think you know. Um, <clears throat> centered mind, chushin, you know, this, I mean, translates literally as center heart, but, you know, with the, with the sense of focus, you know, a, a you know, a, a, a purpose, um, a direction. Uh, mushin, um, <clears throat> no mind, no heart, um, doesn't translate it that easily or well. It really means more in the sense of selflessness. Um, not becoming so fixated on something to the point of distraction. And so in that sense, it also means a single-mindedness. Uh, you are free from all of the concerns, uh, you know, whether it's vanity or, or whatever might distract you from your purpose. That's Mushin. Um, Zanshin, Zanshin is a remaining mind, um, remaining heart. And uh, um, this really harkens back to Chushin. This is a continuing focus, uh, even after you have accomplished something. Um, so, you know, it, it's actually an integral part of Kudo, which is um, the Japanese bow. You often hear that crudely translated as Japanese archery. It's, it's a little bit deeper than that. But um, one of the eight stages of performing correct shooting of the bow is Zanshin. It's the last one, number eight. And, um, and the idea is that even after you have shot the arrow, it's left your bow, it's hit the target, you are still focused on that because if you weren't, you wouldn't hit the target in the first place. It's not unlike, uh, you know, for anybody who, who enjoys marksmanship, you don't just like, you know, let the gun kick or, or wave it around. You exhale and squeeze the trigger and you focus on your target even after the bullet has left the chamber for the same reason, because you're not gonna hit it otherwise. 
uh, binding spirit and flowing spirit. Um, you know, now we're back to kokyu, we're back to timing and positioning. Um, kino musubi uh, means to sort of bind energy or spirit. This is the sense of trying to bind yourself uh, to your partner's energy, force, however you want to translate it. Um, you know, this, it's also a sense of ma'ai, you know, the proper timing and positioning. Um, you know, the idea in this is that you're not, you know, you're not getting in here and dragging him around, you know. You really want to bind yourself to him. This is really what creates that, that, that blending that is so instrumental in, in performing Aiki technique. Um, <clears throat> musubi um, <clears throat> means to, to bind up, to wrap up. Um, if you went and said something about Kino Musubi to the average Japanese person, they kind of look at you, uh, why are you talking about energetic rice balls? Um, <laughs> because Musubi is, um, <clears throat> Musubi is a rice ball wrapped up in, in nori. It, it literally means to form. It's, it's, it's the, the act of shaping the rice ball before you put the nori on. But, you know, that, that idea of forming a connection and using that connection to make the technique work. Um, kino nagare, um, this is, you know, the idea of um, beyond kino musubi, once you have made that connection with your partner, um, using their momentum and their direction to subtly redirect them so that you have the, the most amount of efficiency um, you know, and I mean, there are lots of examples, but, you know, Ushiro Takumi Toyi might be one where I keep moving in to execute the technique. So, you know, I'm not trying to stop him here. I just want to keep flowing until he moves where I want him to. So, you know, you need the two together. You need that connection, and you need to keep moving in a way that stretches that out and flows so that you don't get this, this clashing. Let's see. Oh. Okay, finally we're to Aikido. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the way to meet spirit and martial inspiration. I put these together because um, I think these are really uh, aspirational um, in the sense of you know, ultimate goals or ultimate objectives. Um, Aikido the way to meet spirit, the way of harmony, the way of peace. Um, but it is aspirational. Uh, it, is, um, it is the culmination of O Sensei's many, many years of hard training. And he wasn't the first person to really come up with this idea that there could be something more than mere martial technique, that we don't have to be savages. Um, the, the, the difference between jutsu, which is purely technique, and do, which is a, a, a study that suggests longevity, dedication, commitment. Um, and so it is, I think, uh, a transcendent commitment to an art, and in this case, the art of aiki, the art of blending with a person's spirit. Takemusu, this really was also coined by Sensei. Um, take, we already talked about that. Take is another pronunciation of the word bushi, which is warrior or martial, martialness. Um, and uh, and I, I used inspiration um, because I think that's a sort of a larger concept, but translated literally, um, it is birth. Musu is birth. Um, and, and in this sense, um, it, it, it's kind of a play on words. It's not just the, bir the birth of pure martialness. And so the idea that if you've committed yourself to this art, then you will, you will be inspired by it and your, your technique will be pure. Um, but also this, this sense of birth, creation, creativity. Uh, so in the sense that, as O-sensei felt, um, it doesn't have to be for purely destructive purposes.
purposes, that it can be creative in and of itself. Uh, if you have that kind of power, you also have the wisdom to use it in a way that doesn't necessarily destroy a lesser opponent. Purification and oneness, um, you know, now we're getting into really, this is, I think, um, O Sensei's later years when he truly sought, and, you know, I say that, but this is, Shinto is the indigenous faith of, of Japan, and, you know, even though, it, you know, people might not declare themselves as they would in some other faith, um, I think many Japanese are uh, innately Shinto in the sense that they, you know, they feel um, that there are there are kami. Kami is a, a, a deity, a, a god, a spirit in many things, li living things, but also stones, also people. Um, <clears throat> and so I group these together because they both have to do with a spiritual awareness, which I think O Sensei really sought out after years of um, purely you know, martial technique, he felt like there must be something more. And, and you know, in that sense, he became, uh, you know, very interested in this idea of spirituality. Misogi translates as uh, purification. Um, and this can be done in many ways. And in the Shinto faith, there are many ways to purify. One of the simplest that anybody would encounter if they went to Japan and they went to a Japanese shrine is uh, at the entrance to the shrine, there would be a well uh, where you would take a cup of water and wash your hands. And this is the idea that you need to purify uh, what's, you know, what is bad before you, you know, step into a, you know, over the threshold into something that is more spiritually, um, well, where you, where you should be more spiritually aware. Um, but there are other things. Uh, Furitama. Um, Furitama is something that we, you know, sometimes do in, in class, where we clasp our hands and we, we shake our, our uh, upper torso like this. Um, Fudi means to shake, and tama is your spirit in this case. So you're 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 awakening your spirit. You're also purifying yourself for the training that's to come. Um, Fune kogi undo, which uh, um, uh, Japanese in, in the Shinto uh, realm would would say uh, tori fune. Um, this is the, the boat rowing exercise. That too is a form of, of purification, uh, you know, to, to prepare yourself for the training that's coming. Um, let's see. Uh, and kotodama. Kotodama is, uh, for the Japanese, and they're not alone in this, many cultures think that there, there are certain words that have spiritual power to them. Um, and so when we do this, rowing exercise, for example, and we do yi, ho, yi, ho. That too is a form of purification. Those words are intended to help purify us, focus our thinking, get us ready for training. Last group. Uh, true victory and self-victory and universal victory. Um, all this grouping, I think, suggests a higher path, a path to enlightenment. Um, Masakatsu, um, uh, the true victory. Um, I think that this is kind of the threshold understanding that a true victory um, comes from, uh, well, for lack of something better right now off the top of my head, a sense of how best to avoid conflict, to work around it, rather to, than, than to just engage it like, like a savage. Um, and, and this is also, you know, not specific to O-sensei. Um, uh, Sekiun, who was a uh, 17th century sword master, you know, later in his life, after many years of sword dueling, he came to the realization that, you know, if, if you're all about the duel, if you're all about the fight, the sword fight, and winning or not winning, then you're kind of doomed before you even get to it. 
whether you're doomed to win against lessers or lose against betters or draw against equals, you're just pigeonholed, that you're stuck with that. Um, and so there's got to be something more to it. And that brings us to agatsu, uh, self-victory. Um, so this, of course, is in the sense of victory over your ego, for example. Um, not getting wrapped up in yourself so much that you lose sight of everything that's outside of you. Think of it as like uh, standing in front of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a Monet painting and you're like, you're just looking in it, you know, and you're just stuck on it and all you're seeing is the brush strokes and you don't, you got to step back and see the big picture. Um, <clears throat> then, uh, and after all, Agatsu, you know, that harkens to uh, humility, which is one of the seven martial virtues. Um, and then the last one, Katsu Hayabi, um, victory at the speed of light. Uh, you know, we're back to Spock. It sounds like we're warping into <laughs> space, but um, but uh, you know, this I think suggests a spiritual and moral perfection um, that uh, you you have you have reached a point at which uh, the opponent can't even. Attack. You know, when you all get there, let me know. <laughs> That's it.